don't be the guy that just rides these things up and down because they're not investments. A lot of these things are they're more uh, tradable. Recyclable, uh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, these exactly. are. This isn't Coca Cola. This isn't Delta. Right. You're not going right. to hold this for 50 years and like Warren Buffett. You know, we. That's right. We ride the cycle up and then we sell. Hello and welcome to Capital Cosm, everybody. Today we have a very special and requested guest on the show, Mr. John Polamy. Thank you for coming on, my friend. Happy to be here. Before we get started, though, nothing in this video is financial advice. Neither John nor I are financial advisors. Please do your own due diligence. And uh, yeah, John, give the audience a little uh, brief rundown of yourself. Give them an intro, your background, um, for those who may not know who you are. So uh, I'm just a guy on the internet. That's how I describe myself. Basically, I'm uh, an individual investor. I have a regular job in the energy industry where I've worked for about almost 40 years now. Um, and I have been investing uh, for the same amount of time. The first part of my career up until, I'd say, the great financial crisis unsuccessfully or hit and miss. And so uh, after... I, I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm not bragging or anything, but I, I was ready to retire in 2008, and I violated a lot of my own rules and things I knew better, and got in over my skis, and it uh, taught me some serious lessons. So I decided to like write about it, blog about it, try to educate others. I think if I would have had the exposure to somebody like myself or other people that are you know, this is not this craft of investing is, 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 you know, repeatable and can be, you know, distilled down to a system. And a lot of it's psychological. And I didn't have any mentoring in the, on, when I first started. So I try to do some of that and try to educate people. And I try to impress upon a lot of the younger people, because I have a lot of young, my, I can tell from my, my uh, analytics, a lot of younger people, guys, most mostly and it's like time is your biggest asset right and the, and the laws of compounding and, and and some of the lessons i learned about you know having good uh reasonable expectations and, and, and goal setting and things like that around investing that, that i didn't have you know swinging for the fence uh can be exciting when you connect but uh, a lot of the top home run hitters were also had very low averages i remember uh, just a quick story i used to play stratomatic baseball when i was in high school and one of the guys we had was uh, back in those days was a guy named Dave Kingman. He was a prolific home run hitter. And he was like what we call on the car. It was like a three outcome guy who would either strike out, hit a home run or walk. And that was it. So uh, I think it's better, you know, to be like a Tony Gwynn or a Rod Carew, just hit a lot of singles and doubles. And, you know, you can uh, make a very good career from that and occasional home runs uh, for icing on the cake. So that's kind of my deal. Um, I, you know, have the, a website and a YouTube channel and just talk about whatever I want to talk about. I'm not really well wedded to any, you know, financial firm or anything like that. So I, I try to stay contrarian and, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, off the beaten path. Yeah. So you mentioned some lessons learned, uh, back in 2008, what were some, some of those lessons? Well, Charlie Munger is one of my biggest fans. I suggest everybody watch every video he was ever in. I mean, he's really the success behind Berkshire Hathaway. He's the brains there. And one of the things after reading everything that he ever wrote and watching most of his videos, he has a saying that three, th three L's that will wreck an investor or, or wreck a person's life, liquor, ladies, and leverage. And so uh, suffice to say that, uh, you know, during 2008, we had a big blow off top. It was a, you know, uh, before everything blew up. And then I allowed linear thinking to enter my mind and levered up, uh, assuming certain outcomes that uh, I knew probably weren't going to happen subconsciously, but still did that. So I think that's one of the main lessons is just uh, another thing is, you know, what you see is another main lesson I would say is setting setting expectations correct expectations i tell people go to the berkshire hathaway website and look in the most recent annual report and every annual report they put the total return for that company since they came public and i think it was 1964 or five something like that and if you average all the ups and downs uh, that they've had 
you know, their, their long-term average is about 20% a year, which is, you know, he's Buffett and those guys are considered. So, you know, when we come upon like these certain uh, speculative uh, opportunities where we have a return of a hundred, 200 or 300% or what happened with some people in crypto that tripped over themselves and made some money, however they made it accidentally or because they knew what was going on. Those are abnormal situations. And I think, people kind of set their expectations wrong and then they get into that mode of always chasing that instead of just saying, well, you know, if I put, you know, if I'm able to get like even reasonable 12 to 15% returns and lower my risk, what does that do over a long period of time? And then have the occasional speculation do, you know, triple digits. But I think a lot of people just swing for the fences because that's what's popular on the internet, right? Everybody wants to hear about the guy that bought the uh, uh, speculative stock for a thousand bucks and two years later he was a millionaire. Well, that's that does happen, but not very often. You don't hear about the other 999 guys that, you know, blew up. So, yeah. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned uh, you mentioned that you were, uh, you know, you've been investing since the, you know, what, 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 when did you start, when did you start investing again? Probably about 30 or 40 years ago, 30 or 40 years ago. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the lessons, you know, the lessons that you, 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 you essentially, uh, you know, push out is that not to, you know, kind of diversify, not to be in kind of one stock. Well, we saw this past, these past couple of years, we saw a 200% run in the commodity space. Um, but then this year in 2023, energy is actually one of the least performing sectors um, out there. And that's because, you know, we've got to revert back to a little bit of a reversion back to mean there. Um, how how are you kind of positioning your, um, your, your energy or commodities portfolio? Are you still adding um, during these uh, drawdowns? Or uh, what do you, you know, what do you kind of position yourself in? So, you had back-to-back years where energy outperformed uh, 21 and 22. So if you look at uh, on usfunds.com, uh, Frank uh, Holmes has a chart there where they show like, uh, um, or it's like a matrix that shows like commodities. And you'll notice that the commodity that does well in one year, typically the next year doesn't outperform to your point right. aversion to the mean happens quite a bit. Um, and so, you know, I'm a long, I kind of got to explain this a little bit. So I am a long-term sec, I believe we're in a secular long-term bull market for commodities, maybe over the next decade or so. So that means that um, if you looked at it from like 2020 and woke up in 2030, you would see the chart go from the lower left to the upper right. However, during that secular bull market and any secular bull market that's long-term like that, you're going to have periods of cyclicality, cyclical downturns. And that's what we're in now. Um, it's obvious. Uh, one of the things I've been talking about in the, inside my newsletter and also on my channel a little bit is, you know, you're seeing weakness in copper, weakness in energy, and people are kind of scratching their head. Well, I thought we were in a bull market. We are because of underinvestment and some of the other things we can get into, but those things take years to play out. You can have periods of, you know, a year to 18 months where you have a cyclical decline, uh, which is what we're in now because, you know, we basically have recessions in the EU uh, Ch China's probably close to being in a recession. The United States is heading for a recession. So you're going to see weakness there. You're going to see, you know, we're seeing tightening liquidity. We're seeing the Fed has raised rates at the quickest pace that it has ever done in 40 years. You're seeing QT. So you have liquidity tight. You have a lot of headwinds that are against this secular uh, long-term bull, but they're going to manifest in a cyclical downturn. So I haven't really been buying anything. As a matter of fact, I trimmed some of my positions back. I'm, I'm never going to be fully 100% cash, but I think that, you know, when you have the kind of returns we had, like you mentioned earlier, uh, it's prudent to trim back or take some profits. Um, I haven't really been adding anywhere. I mean, I've added like maybe one company uh, recently, uh, but the position sizing is small. And so, the time, there's going to be a tremendous opportunity, I think, in the next six months to eight months. You know, I, I created a framework to try to um, forecast, uh, uh, you know, how liquidity, how these rate increases move through the economy. And, you know, it's obvious with manufacturing PMIs are in contraction around the world in the U.S., leading economic indicators. I can go, I can read off the litany. Basically, 
Um, you know, I'm not an economist. I don't try to forecast the economy. I kind of now cast where are we right now? And so, you know, the bottom line is uh, uh, liquidity and sediment, uh, I think, drive things in the short term, short term being six months to a year. And right now, liquidity is tightening. And it has been. I've been talking about that probably six months now. And sediment is negative. I mean, uh, so you're basically trying to sail upstream into the wind. It's kind of difficult to do that. I think the best thing to do is, depending on your temperament and your uh, your uh, risk tolerance, you know, there's nothing wrong with sitting there going and just being in a money market fund or go to Treasury Direct and get 5% risk-free to wait, husband cash. Think about, you know, look at what happens when the the tide turns and I think you'll be able to buy a lot of these things a lot cheaper. Now, obviously, you know, you can look at we're, we're, we're I believe, you know, with the exception of seven or eight stocks in the S and P like Apple and some of these larger cap stocks, I mean, the market's actually down. So you're in a bear market. Most stocks go down in a bear market. So I think, um, for example, just talk about oil, for example, I think you could see 50 before you see 150. So, really? yeah, I mean, uh, hmm. so I think that, uh, it's not positive when the Saudis, you know, have two meetings in a row and we're talking about first voluntary cuts and then more cuts and then, you know, price action. You have to respect price action. So uh, it's telling you something. It's telling you that, uh, you know, uh, you know, demand for these commodities is set at the margin. A 1% overproduction uh, or 1%, uh, I mean, 1% of oversupply or 1% of, uh, of, 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 um, demand higher than 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 base uh can sway the price quite a bit so i think that's what we're at and then sediment starts kicking in right you know people get negative they're bearish they pile on that's why you see like every rally just about gets sold and so i'm not like a you know i still think that you know the underinvestment and the growth in hydrocarbon demand around the world will exert itself over several years but i think you just have to get to this period of softness that uh is going to happen because i mean the the, the data doesn't lie the you know europe the united states china they're all in you know manufacturing recessions and, and heading now you see, even see the service pmis are are starting to come down you know so that's something i started tracking because it's easy to say well what framework are you working from you can say well the economy's strong or it's weak or whatever well what data are you actually looking at and all this data is free to look at uh you can you know and then you just go back and say well if the leis leading economic indicators are down 13 months in a row every time that the leading economic indicators have dropped have been down that much you can look at a chart going back 20 years you're in a recession so typically you're going to have softness in these commodities cyclically for some period of time during those recessionary periods now what will happen what will be the response of central banks once um, you know, the, the the tightening liquidity starts affecting, we already started seeing some of the cracks in, in, in the economy, right? I kind of use the metaphor or make it analogous to you're living in Pompeii around the volcano and you're feeling these earthquakes and tremors and you're seeing smoke coming out of the volcano. It's telling you something, okay? Something's getting ready to happen here that's not good. And that's the same thing with a lot of these indicators. So I'm not an economist. Again, I'm not going to say they're going to have a soft landing, hard landing. I do know that when we go into a recessionary conditions, you're going to have weakness in these uh, resource markets. But that's an opportunity. You should get your shopping list together. And then when it's the time of maximum pe pessimism, when everybody's thrown in the towel and says, that's it, we're done, then you can start adding again. You know, there, Because the underinvestment thesis is the big play. But then again, because these prices are set at the margin, it just takes a very little bit of undersupply or oversupply to sway the price quite a bit. And then you get, again, uh, liquidity factors and sediment that can exacerbate these these moves. So that's what I would caution people. And I've been saying that it's, you know, there's no reason to do anything except sit here for it, 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 in T-bills for, for, and get five over 5% now risk-free and just kind of see how things play out. I mean, I ask people, what's the impetus for oil to go higher? And, you know, well, well, the, re the recovery in China didn't play out like I thought it would. It was weaker than we thought it was going to be. Uh, that was one of the things. Uh, it's just, 
it's 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 just the nature of how these things go. But again, I think eventually you're going to see all time inflation adjusted highs in the oil price by the end of this decade. I know that's kind of a that's kind of a cop out. People people want actionable. You know, what should I? You know, when? Well, you're saying it's going to go higher. When's it going to go higher? It's impossible to know. But you can see the lack of investment. You can see these things, but it's just being kind of like the wet blanket of the cyclical nature of the world economy kind of slowing down. That's uh, you just got to get past that. And then what will happen? They'll reliquify. We'll go into another liquidity cycle. Rates will be cut. And then, you know, you'll go into another cycle of of uh, of prices uh, going, you know, going higher because the demand will come back. And there right. simply hasn't been sufficient investment in these things. Right. So tight end liquidity and sentiment is what are two of the two of the indicators that you're looking at to um you know precipitate your current action, which is has been a trim and just to hold on to, you know, T build and stuff like that. What are some of the indicators that you would look at that would signal to you to get back in, um, back into the market, back into, you know, resource stocks in general? So I track uh there's various data points that I track, like I talked about leading economic indicators, which the conference board leading economic indicators, that's free. Anybody can go to that website and look at it. Um, that gets reported. I think that uh, there's a guy on, um, there was a, there was a segment on wealthy on, I can't remember the guy's name now, but he works for Piper Jaffrey. There's a, they created a, a proprietary system to determine what, how these liquidity uh, works its way through an economy. It's called the hope cycle. I forget the guy's name, but I basically have rebuilt. I spent the last month in my spare time kind of rebuilding my own. I'm not going to go through the whole thing about what it goes into, but there's certain indicators in there around PMIs, which are purchasing managers index for manufactured goods. Anything above 50 is expansion. Anything below 50 is contraction. You want to see like housing starts, things like this, but these things are all influenced by what interest rates and, you know, uh, Right now, we're there, we we have we still have uh, the lag effect of the 500 basis points rise in interest rates over the last 14 months. You know, when you when the Fed raises rates, those rate increases don't necessarily take effect immediately. They take time to work their way. This is the problem that many people. I I didn't realize this either. And once I started building this model and looking at it, yes, you can see how the rate increases in the in the tightening liquidity work their way through the economy with a lag, okay? And uh, so I think leading the economic indicators, PMIs around the world, things like that is what I would look at. And then, you know, another thing I look at is central bank actions. Right now, people don't understand this, but I would say 90% of the central banks in the world are in rate tightening, they're in a rate tightening cycles, they're raising rates. And there's a site, uh, there's a site that tracks this on a daily basis. Uh, I don't have off the top of my head, but I can, I can send it out or, or whatever, but uh, to you, but, you know, since the beginning of the year, we've had like 88 central banks raise rates and only 13 cut rates. This is what I'm talking about. Do you have tightening liquidity all over the world to deal with this inflation issue? And eventually it'll get dealt with because that's, that's the only tool they have, right? Is, you know, if you're a central bank and your only tool is to, you know, tighten or create liquidity, you know, or if you, what's the, the, what people say is if you have a 10 pound hammer, everything looks like a nail, right. Or everything. But, you know, if you're walking around the house trying to kill a fly with a 10 pound mall, you're going to have a lot of holes in your wall. And so, uh, uh, you know, this is the problem. So, but again, the liquidity cycle, this is what they'll do. They're going to rate, they've raised rates. They'll tighten liquidity heal. Something breaks in the economy, something breaks in the financial markets. You know, if the S and P comes down 30%, they're going to start cutting rates. If the economy starts, uh, unemployment starts rising uh, to a certain point, you know, you get to a five, four point eight five percent you're in an election year coming up, they'll start cutting rates. And then the liquidity cycle will reverse, and then you will see liquidity come in, and then you will see, especially in the resource sector, there it's really affected by liquidity, okay? It's, uh, it's the first thing, you know, because it's all speculative. Most of the companies are junior mining companies and things like this. So it's a very speculative uh, arena that's driven by liquidity. When liquidity tightens, those type of sectors in the market, you know, 
are the first ones to dry yeah. up and blow away. So that's, I mean, I'm talking around it a lot. I'm trying to jump around, but that's, that's kind of what I'm, that's the framework I'm working for. Again, I'm not a PhD trying to predict the economy that uh, nobody can do that, but you know, it's obvious if you look at, you know, liquidity and sediment is really what drives the market in the short to medium term. So I, I, until that, until those switch over, uh, you, I don't, I don't see why anybody would be in a hurry to, uh, to try to try to call a bottom. What about the uh, law of unintended consequences when it comes to, to raising rates? Uh, you end up having a, whole, a bit of a more of a supply tightening as well on the resource side because you have these highly capital intensive companies and all of a sudden financing becomes a lot harder to get and thereby cr- providing a, an even greater supply crunch and even more inflation from the supply side. What about that? I think you're absolutely right, and I'm glad you brought that up. Let's use an example of a company that used to be in my portfolio that I sold, Peabody Energy, which is a coal producer, okay? You can go on, people will defend it like you wouldn't believe what's, go, you know, on Twitter, okay? The stock has dropped a lot. Why? Because coal prices have dropped. Why? Because mm-hmm. natural gas prices have dropped, okay? But no one's going to build a new coal mine. The, zeit, the current zeitgeist in the economy or uh, or in the social structure won't allow for, you know, who's investing in new coal mines, who's going to permit a new coal mine, what banks are going to finance a new coal mine. And so eventually, you know, when, when the, when the worm does turn and the economy comes back and we're back into, you know, uh, expansion, then the demand for coal will increase. But to your point, there won't be the supply available because there's been no financing. You have social, uh, zeitgeist is against it. The banks are against it. Everybody's against it. So, um, and so you don't want to be, I, I still like the company, uh, but you know, the stock price has dropped quite a bit. Now, some people will say, well, just ride through these things. Well, that's fine too. You can do that. But if you're going to be in these companies and ride through these downturns, understand with a company that actually has earnings and sales and possibly, is buying back stock and has a dividend, it could still drop 50% in this type of market. And some of these junior, excuse my language, shit goes, they can drop 90% in this type of environment. And I don't think a lot of guys understand that. And so my idea is why, why fight the Fed? There used to be a guy named Marty Zweig that I used to uh, be enamored with when I was a kid on Wall Street week, he would come on there. And he used to talk about this all the time. Don't fight the Fed, you know, talking about, you know, three rate increases by the fed you should sell three rate cuts by the fed buy these were just like general things so that was the whole thing about the liquidity and sediment you know you're just you, sediment's horrible right now uh, it, it, everybody understands we're you know pretty much the discussion has shifted from you know it, we were in a good economy to well it's going to be a soft landing no landing or hard landing. so if people are acknowledged you're going to have recession so there's really no reason to be at this point buying these companies now they will they were not, they will be tremendous bargains, you know, like I said, six months from now, eight months from now, something like that. Once the worm turns and that's when you'll want to uh, be buying these things. And of course it won't be obvious. It'll be painful to do it. People will be like, well, why am I doing this? We're in the middle of a recession, blah, 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 blah. But that's what, you know, once the liquidity, that will be the response. And that's when you want to buy then that's when you want to go whole hog. And so, uh, it, it's just being trying to be counter cyclical, but I don't like to be a hundred. I don't want to give the impression I'm a hundred percent in and out of the market. I'm not that good of a trader, but I do think like to your point, when we started the conversation, some of the companies that I had in my portfolio that were junior oil and gas, some of the things were up to 300%. You've got to take some of those profits off the table. You know what I mean? I mean, you, you can be even, you know, if you have those kind of returns, you can even at least sell, everything and just keep your original investment type thing you know then you've paid for, you've, you've put something ride. in your pocket yeah exactly it's the free ride and so there's different strategies it's all based on individual risk tolerance and what people are willing to put up with but don't be the guy that just rides these things up and down because they're not investments a lot of these things are they're more uh tradable or cyclical uh, yeah exactly yeah these exactly. are this isn't coca-cola this isn't delta That's right. you're not gonna right. hold this for 50 years and like Warren Buffett, you know, we, That's right. we ride the cycle up and then we sell. That's exactly right. So understanding the cyclicality, understanding the volatility, accepting that. And, but you have to like be able to look at that 
There's a good um, company that's very good at doing this. It's called Altius Minerals. It's a royalty company in Canada. If you go and look at their presentation, they kind of describe how they buy resources at the, uh, they buy royalties at the bottom of the cycle, how they, basically how they take advantage of the cycles. It, they have some pretty, they used to, in their presentation, have a pretty good explanation about how the cyclicality of the resource sector works and how they deploy capital at certain points and how they harvest, you know, returns at, at, at near, at the you know at the tops you're not going to bottom ticket obviously but you're not going to top ticket but if you can catch you know two-thirds or three-quarters of a move i mean well you're going to do, be doing pretty good i guarantee it so yeah I mean, we kind of jumped around a little bit i hope it wasn't you know confusing uh but uh that's uh that's kind of my framework you know yeah um, so so let's jump back to china you mentioned china's reopening why do you think that was so lackluster because a lot of uh, inv uh resource speculators were kind of hoping on china to to push us towards the next leg up in this commodity super cycle. So why do you think uh, that wasn't as uh, as eventful? Well, I think mostly because um, by the time they reopened, which was maybe late, like December or January, well, January of this year, um, I think a lot of their economy was based on exports and we already had seen softening in Europe and in the U, you know, in the U.S. We had you know softening going on. Um, my idea was okay. Looking at all the rest of the, now, if you look at the service sector, like airline traffic has, re, you know, they're traveling, they're doing those things. The service sector is still in expansion there, but it's such an export-based economy, mercantile economy, that if the rest of the world is, you know, contracting or going towards recession that the, that sector of the economy is just going to drag you know drag butt it's just not going to be able to do anything and they didn't come with the type of what they have done in the past and i think it's a sea change what they have done in the past is they would massively stimulate their economy whenever they would have any kind of downturns and they really didn't do that coming out of this they really kind of changed their mentality since xi, xi jinping i think has become emperor for life or whatever you want to call them um, they're, they're trying to change some of the dynamic and get away from having to, you know, just build cities with no one lit just to create economic activity. That's just unsustainable. And I think they're going through a transitionary period of that and, and, and they're not doing the previous playbook of, okay, step on the gas hard, uh, as we come out of this, I, they did some targeted stimulus, but it really wasn't a lot. So I think that's, that's probably why I kind of underperformed. I think I made the assumption and, you know, I admit when I'm wrong that that's what they would do. That was their playbook in the past. They would come out of this thing. They would want to ensure that they got a good lift off, you know, coming out of the um, lockdowns and they would step on the gas hard and they really didn't do that. And uh, and I think that not doing that, plus the the rest of the cyclical weakness around the world uh, where they export into uh, uh, that, that's kind of a wet blanket also. So. Yeah, I mean, they still had record. They still have record oil demand right now. They just made a new forty-year all-time record in oil imports. So, I mean, some of this stuff is kind of confusing. Also, there's a lot of data points, but uh, um, you know, I think that uh, uh, that that's part of the part of the problem is just you know you you really have to try to analyze a lot of these things, and it's it's uh, you know you have to make certain assumptions when you're doing it and you're, when you're forecasting and sometimes the assumptions are wrong and then the forecasts you just got to be ready to pivot but i think a lot of this is a lesson learned too for a lot of folks when you're wrong you're wrong man just say you're wrong i mean i learned this playing poker a lot playing poker i used to play poker online before they outlawed it and i read every book i could find and i started realizing the psychology and it was it wasn't that hard to make money online poker because people would just play every hand they wouldn't play correctly and they and then they would you could tell that they just you know it's the same thing on this deal if you're wrong you're wrong you just got to fold the hand you know what i mean say i'm wrong and i'll preserve my capital and come back when the setup is 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 more in my in my favor uh that, that but i think what a lot of guys do is they just ride things down and they start getting into this hope thing I made those yeah. mistakes earlier in my career too, and it, it will set you back. You can't do it. If you're wrong, if you have, you know, I, I, I tell people when you make, when you commit capital, whether it's in long-term investment or a speculation, write it down in a notebook. Why am I committing capital to this particular company? Why am I buying this copper company? Uh, whatever reason, the I anticipate the cash flow to go up because this new mine's going to open. It's going to have these costs. Uh, we're in a rising copper demand environment. Copper, I, you know, it looks like it may go from 325 to four, whatever your reasoning is. Then if it doesn't happen, 
like that, you revisit it. If it's not happening and the stock is not performing, then you have to say, well, I have to revisit my thinking on this. And if it's not correct, I got to can X this and move on to the next thing. There's nothing, people need to do this. They don't do it. What they do is they, they hear something or the, the big thing was uranium is a big lesson for a lot of people. People like to chase the shiny object. They don't want to do the work themselves. They don't want to do the things. So well, so-and-so on the internet, or I heard this guy say this, so I'm going to do this. And they just buy without thinking. Then the thing drops 30% on them. They get demoralized the thing fossilizes in their brokerage account. And then there's like, well, I'm just going to sell when it gets back to eat. I'm even can't do that, you know, because what's, for example, you know, if you have a 25% loss, what do you need to get back to even, you know, and then if you have a 50% loss, you need a hundred percent gain then to get back. That's not easy to do. So if you have yeah. a stock that drops from 10 to five and the fundamentals are totally opposite of why you bought it, you have to sell it because you need a hundred percent gain now. And you, you you're holding it, based on reasons that are 180 degrees out of phase from why you bought it. So most people won't do that. They have to do that. If you're going to be in this game and, and something doesn't work, you just got to cull it and move on to the next thing and preserve your capital. That's, that, that's kind of like in the cyclical type investing, you know, there's, I do actually invest in long-term things too. Uh, that's a different story, but these cyclical speculations, I call them, uh, you can make a lot of money, but to your point, I mean, you got to understand the cyclicality, respect it. And then if it's not going your way, you got to, you, you got to, if you made a bad call, you'd say, I made a bad call and fold it. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, to, uh, just really quickly to your point on China really quick. Uh, I was actually in China. I toured all around China, um, oh, via wow. train and, uh, you, you just, you're just like zooming on past like middle of nowhere and you just start seeing these ghost cities. Like huge skyscrapers, no one's there. Like you see it all over China. So I know I know exactly what you're referring to there. So uh, to kind of tie up the knot in terms of knowing when you're wrong, what would get you to change your mind about this current commodity uh, super cycle? What, what would be some of the things that you would see that would kind of make you reconsider that we were actually in a uh, commodity super cycle? Well, I think we're in it. Uh, it's just, like I said, I mean, you just don't, you just need demand to weaken just a little bit for prices to go down. But I don't think prices are going to drop like, you know, uh, like you've seen in the past, just because things are so tight mm -hmm. to begin with. And um, so, you know, uh, like I said, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. I don't say these things to be provocative, but, you know, seeing oil get down to, um, like I said, with a five handle on it, uh, on Brent, see copper, maybe s slightly get under $3 a pound. And then I'm going to begin be getting interested again, because I think that's going to be coinciding with maximum pessimism. And then I think, you know, coinciding with once I see, you know, central banks reversing their tightening, and then, then, then I'll kind of know, I mean, it's not going to be, you're not going to catch the exact bottom, you know what I mean? But I want to see more pessimists. There's still too many oil bulls out there. There's still yeah. the Canadian oil mafia on Twitter, having their Friday night, four hour sessions, justifying the oil prices. It's dropped by 50%. I mean, you can get in this and over, I mean, if you price actions telling you something guys, and it's, you know, these are smart guys, but you start getting wetted. I think you allow these things to become part of your persona and you don't want to, you know, uh, so there's, like I said, I still own some oil stocks. I mean, I'll never sell Canadian national resources. This is a good company and the dividend safe and stuff like that. But, you know, I think more of these speculative things, I'm not going to go whole hog until I see more, more pessimism. I just don't see that right now. I see a lot of people saying, well, we're going to have a soft landing. It's not going to be that bad, you know, blah, 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 blah. Well, I mean, something, something's not right here. Price action's telling people something. And when I see across the board now in three major economic blocks, in basically manufacturing recessions, that's not good. That's not positive for resources in the short term. Again, I expect to see all-time highs for oil, copper. I, I expect to see copper at 10, 12, $15 a pound by the end of this decade. There simply isn't enough yeah. copper being found for the, our needs, but that doesn't mean it's going to happen in the next six months or eight months. We could you know, have weakness. Same thing with oil. I fully expect oil to be some point hit 200, $250 a barrel. That would be an inflation adjusted new highs. Uh, and people can't conceive of that right now, but you know, you, you know, I'm not going to write, I, I would prefer not to write it down to 50 and junior companies that are going to get cut in half. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me. 
why do you th why do you think that the oil drillers um OIH, for example, hasn't been tracking the price of oil. It's actually been trading fairly sideways as the oil prices are coming down. Is that, um, you know, what's that all about? Is that like a, cer a certain signal being sent out to the market that um, speculative money is still positioning itself for a bit of a more of a upside move in oil? Well, I think it's interesting you mentioned that because I'm extremely bullish on um, especially offshore oil drilling. I think that's where the growth is going to come from. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's important for anybody that's interested in the energy markets to read the Goring and Rosenzweig Q1 2023 resource report that they do. They talk about, they've been talking about this for like several years, the um, peak in shale in the United States. Uh, and they use a lot of AI uh, generated uh, analysis, but down to each well in, you know, the Eagleford, Bakken, and, and and you've seen the, like, basically the, per, the, the, the shale revolution in the U.S. basically um, saved us from, you know, saved the world uh, because conventional oil production has been in decline since 2014 at peaked. And so there's been no, um, we had the shale revolution, if you want to call it that or whatever, and it kind of made up the seven or eight million barrels a day that the declines and the rest of non-OPEC. And so, what I think has happened is, is, you know, we've had so many, the cyclicality of, of the, um, uh, of, of like the oil market, how it affected OIH, you know, there's a lot of the components of that, of that index, offshore oil drillers, boat, service boat operators, um, other companies that build like underwater trees, Helix, uh, you know, all these companies that are in there that do all this work. I mean, they never really had the move, even when oil went to like $130 uh, that is true. Yeah. after the invasion and that was totally out of context for previous moves somebody put a dot plot up showing that where the oil price is typically were oih trades and it never really caught fire the the, the thing to note is though if you look at that industry if that whole industry and most of those components there they just they just went through over the last three years probably the worst depression they were ever in that industry has atrophied so much and and the fundamentals are actually improving there. For example, like offshore oil drilling companies, seventh generation uh, drill ships, which are the top of the line ships, they're hundred percent leased. You can't get one right now. And so day rates consequently have been going up. Their fundamentals have been getting better and they will get better throughout this decade. But you're right, there's been, I mean, I can talk about one of the offshore service vessel companies which probably has one of the best managements I've ever seen has played capital allocation perfectly. And they said something recently on their, um, on, on their calls recently, which is, you know, they have seen for this cycle highs in their day rates for their boats, but the day rates would still have to double from here before they would even think about buying another right. boat. No one's going to build another drill ship. No Chinese yard is going to build you a drill ship unless you come up with like most of the money up front they're not going to finance it for you because they got burned so bad so it's another example what i call this whole rust rust is your friend right and tankers and offshore drilling rigs and all this stuff because it's all made out of steel it has a life of 20 to 25 years most of this stuff is aged out or the stuff that is good there's such a small amount of this so that any capital that comes into this it, which it will inevitably and it already is uh will uh is going to cause a um i mean is going to cause an outsized return i think they'll have their day in the sun again we're going to have to get through this cyclical period and then you know you, any listen to any conference call for any company that's involved with offshore oil and gas exploration or production I mean, I drive by here in Houston, the National Oil Varco uh, shops, they're completely packed the parking lots. They're running two shifts over there. So even if oil goes to 40 or 50 bucks a share, if you're Shell or if you're Exxon developing offshore Guiana, you don't care what the price of oil is because the lifting costs are so low and the project timeframes are so long that you're just going to make your investments. And in, uh, because... I mean, you'd have to have like oil go to like 20 and stay there for years. It's that's not going to happen. Yeah. So I, I think that's one sector, but again, 
the, the stocks don't, the, just because the fundamentals are good, the stock price might not care because in a bear market of stocks, most stocks go down. And you'll yeah. see people just sell to sell and the fundamentals will just get better and they'll just get more, the, the cake will become tastier looking. So that's why I say just wait because the price action on the stocks, you look at the charts, they don't look good. They don't look like they're in uptrends, a lot of them. So you can see that it's like, well, the fundamentals don't match what I'm seeing in the stock prices. Well, they don't necessarily have to in a short period of time, even over six months to a year. But knowing, you know, that eventually fundamentals do play out. I, I always say, like Druckenmiller, that's, he's another one of my favorites. Liquidity and sediment in the short term, but in the long term, fundamentals do is, is yeah. what, you know, plays out. So I mean, again, that. No, I was just going to say that. I mean, that's the whole point of being an investor is just to uh, capitalize on mispricing. And the fact that their mispricing can't exist, you can go both ways, right? Exactly, exactly. So that's what happens, though, right? When it, when we had the invasion and oil spiked to 130, then everybody starts getting on Twitter spaces. Well, it's going to go to 160 or 180. It's the new shiny objects. A lot of the retail guys come in, guys that jump around, frogs on lily pads, and then the tourists, I call them, bleacher bums, whatever. I, I used to be one. I'm, I, I know how this works. That's why I, I see what's going on. So that's the time to be trimming it's hard psychologically sometimes you get start getting visions of sugar plums and you start reading the article about the guy that had a thousand bucks and turned it into 500 grand or that idiot that was uh on that that was on twitter with doge that went you, you know what i'm talking about yeah. that's what gets advertised not the other 999 guys that got wiped out you know so uh, i think just being prudent and trying to catch the majority of the move uh and the reverse i think you hit it the, ex the exact word which i left out cyclicality and then that mean reversion when you get to an extreme and you get two standard deviations above the mean you, the yellow light should be going off in your head wait a minute how much more can this really go i'm sitting on some of these juniors with 200 300 gains that's not normal maybe i should take some of this down you know that should be like coming into people's thinking unfortunately it doesn't because 300 why can't it go up 600 that's how people start that's how the mind works right so yeah, we're talking a lot about psychology, but that's a lot of it of this game is is your psychology and your own, uh, you know, perceptions of of reality. So anyway. that's essentially what it is. It's just mob. It's just mob psychology. I mean, you look at you look at the charts. Um, I know I know you're not a big fan of technical analysis, but uh, the, the charts can tell you a little bit about like this. It paints a picture of the psychology of the mob as it traverses through time. Um, Cool. Uh, so do you see any similarities? Because you mentioned that you know you were a participant in the last um, commodity super cycle in 08 um, in the 2000s uh, that was precipitated by China uh, back then. But do you see any similarities or differences? What, what similarities or differences do you see between um, this commodity super cycle versus the one uh, before it? 